Welcome to episode, that was weird. Welcome? What the heck is that? Welcome to episode 58 of the Clarity Compressed Podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly. I will be your host. And today, it doesn't suck. Clarity can only really exist in the light of truth. Branding just isn't a tactic. It's a lifestyle change. Yes, if you haven't gathered by now, today was an amazing interview with Carvana CEO Ernie Garcia. A little monumental in the sense that this is the first time we've had uh, the CEO of a publicly traded company on the show. But honestly, Ernie is somebody that I've really looked at um, with um, an appreciation for the last years, specifically for what he has done in the automotive industry. And I think that pulling it outside of the automotive industry the important thing is that it's in the retail industry and it's really with a focus on heart and a focus on what it is that people want. Now, within the auto industry, I think that Carvana is often kind of demonized. And we talk about that a little bit in the show. I, you know, I asked Ernie, I was like, you know, do you feel hated by some dealers? And his answer is really great. Um, and I think really indicative of the type of person that he is. But what I love about what Carvana is doing and has done is the fact that in true entrepreneurial form, they don't get to pick what people think, right? And as entrepreneurs and people who want to start the business, like we don't get to choose how people feel about an industry or feel about a product or feel about a brand. We just don't get to choose. And acknowledging that fact, they said, okay, this is how people actually feel. And we're going to try to solve that problem. We're going to meet them where they're at and we're going to bring them hopefully a product or service offering that makes them feel better about the process. And in its simplest form, honestly, that's what Carvana has done. And I think in its simplest form, that's what any good business does. They listen to the customer and they deliver something that the customer want, wants. If the customer isn't happy about something, it is heard and it is addressed. What has happened in large industries, um, automotive being one of them, is that it's just been that way for so long that there was no other viable option. And so the customers have had these sentiments. They feel like the process is really bad and really emotionally draining. And they feel like they're gonna be taking advantage of, taken advantage of, and those feelings exist. And dealers have not listen to that, historically speaking, I'm happy to say that that is actually changing and that adoption curve is happening really, really quickly. And I think that Carvana is to thank, I'm not gonna say to blame, I'm gonna say to thank for that. So whether you're a retail customer or you're a dealer in the automotive business, I think it's important to recognize that we now know exactly what the customer wants. We have the same data. I've said this before, like Carvana is using and leveraging the same data points that we have in the automotive industry and we have as the retail industry when it comes to consumer sentiment and what they want. And now it's great to see that we're meeting that as an industry, or at least starting to. I'd say the top 10% of dealers are really starting to meet that in a significant way. So so um, that's it. Hope you enjoy this interview with Ernie Garcia, founder and CEO of the publicly traded car company Carvana. Hey, Paul, it's Ernie. Ernie, good morning. How are you? Doing great. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all. Thank you for giving some time to us today. Um, I, I know you're super busy, and I, I think the, the audience of the podcast is really primarily started as automotive, but now it's also very focused on retail, consumer sentiment, uh, modern day branding. So um, I think the audience is going to get a lot out of just spending a little bit of time with you. So it, it's so great to have you. Great. Well, I'm excited to be here. So um, I wanted to start off by talking about why you started Carvana. And I know there's some elements, a lot of elements that are out there on this already. But I think like, you know, kind of the abridged version, because a lot of people, I think, would see you from the outside and think that you're just, um, you know, a young techie disruptor that really wanted to get into an industry. But the, the truth is, is that you have experience in the auto industry before Carvana. So like, why did you decide to, car to start Carvana? And what was that experience? that you had prior to Carvana. Yeah, so we, 
Yeah, so ha- happy. I mean, you asked me a bridge version, which I'm not sure I do a bridge version. So I'll, that's I'll that, do my that's best. okay. Then give yeah. give us a full version. We we can make it work. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, so before Carvana, I, I was working in a company called Drive Time. Um, you know, prior to that, I worked uh, basically inside of a principal transactions group, which is kind of like a hedge fund inside of a bank um, in New York for a couple of years. I was at Drive Time basically from 2007 through uh, 2012 when I kind of moved over to Carvana full time. And so, and, and I also kind of grew up in and around uh, Drive Time and kind of prior businesses that, that were predecessors to Drive Time. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, from when I was 16 years old, I was um, either working in automotive retail companies or automotive finance companies as like a summer intern. And so I, I had a lot of exposure over time to the business. I think yeah. uh, there's probably many ways to talk about where Carvana came from. Uh, what I'll do to kind of put it in the context of my personal experience, I'll just say that I do think, you know, drive time focuses on, uh, you know, customers with less than perfect credit. Um, and, and kind of that's always been its sweet spot um, since inception. And yep. I think that the unfortunate reality is that um, most of drive time's competition is probably kind of the, the toughest um, dealership experience that people think of when they think of a dealership, right? It, it, it really Without is a like a dirt lot and, you know, you know, a gold chain and a big watch and, you know, <laughs> fast talking and a deal that's not, you know, totally forthright and a car that may not be in the best shape. And so I, I think, think I saw that of, guy it, in one of your commercials. Yeah, I think you got probably. that guy we, for we, one of your... <laughs> yeah, we, we found him. Yeah, there's, you we, found, we found that, that guy. guy, right. You know, one of the things yeah. that that struck me first about Carvana and probably one of my first exposures to the company was really the tone of the advertising. I think a lot of people, if they, if they're not in a place where they have driven by, you know, one of the, one of the vending machines, their first exposure is going to be some element of digital or online. And really at the, the tip of the spear on that stuff is some really um, poignant messaging and like an overall vibe to it. So I don't know if you could, you can kind of explain like what the intention is behind the vibe of the messaging and and what it is, but that I think that's most people's first exposure to it. So I think it'd be cool to hear from you, like what you're going for and why you're going for it. So I think, um, you know, listen, I, I think, I don't think car dealers um, are in any way, shape, or form bad or trying to generate bad experiences. And I think that many mm-hmm. car dealers do a good job. But I, mm-hmm. I do think that, like, there's a reason that the industry has the reputation that it has. And I, I think mm-hmm. it, it basically stems from just the cutthroat um, economics of you know, sameness across all these dealers. But then yeah. once that reputation exists, I think you have to build a brand that recognizes you know, where customers are. And so I think before you get to the messaging, you know, like the name Carvana came from like, we want to build a company that is the antithesis of the stress that you feel, you know, mm-hmm. when you're sitting across the table negotiating the price of your car and then wondering if the car's high quality and if your uncle's going to make fun of you for how much you paid, right? We, so yeah. <laughs> that Vana is about like that peacefulness. And, and, and I think that does come across. I mean, there's definitely a lighthearted element. Um, you know, you don't take yourself too seriously. Um, which is, you know, it's funny because I, I know, respect and work with a lot of car dealers and um, there's this perception, I think, I, I remember, so let me tell you a story. I was in a room and I had just seen that that, that didn't suck video, which was, I thought was hilarious and I thought it was really well targeted, really well produced. I really appreciated actually the behind the scenes version, you know, when you can see actually you on set and just kind of enjoying, enjoying the kind of fantastic and whimsical element of it. Like you have a choreographer and a guy's wearing a kimono and singing a song. And then you have the blow up dancey guy. Like it really hit all these, these key points. And I was in a room with, with some dealers and I'm like, Hey, just so you know, like you shouldn't be looking at from a branding and marketing standpoint, you shouldn't be looking at you know, the other car dealers, like look at someone who understands B to C. And I, I, I thought it would be great to show that video. I'm like, here's the example of the extreme, right? This is someone who understands the demographic and is communicating in a way that they'll understand. And let me tell you, I got 30 seconds into the video and everybody was so like straight faced that I actually stopped the video. I was like, well, you get the point. And I didn't think there was going to be so much offense in the room. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, like this is really, I I was kind of looking at it from a branding advertising standpoint and realizing that like some of the perceptions are what were offensive. And then a conversation ensued after that. And I talk about this a lot is like, we don't get to pick what other people think. Right. And if they think those things, 
Like we all have dealers. Carvana has the same data set. Dealers have the same data set that says that people are just unhappy with the process. People are just unhappy with the tension they feel going into it. Along with that, so at the retail forum, you presented a slide deck and I, I really appreciated the way you went through the industry and you kind of broke it down and you said, hey, like the next closest industry to the size of the automotive industry is household goods. And can you can you give us a little summary of like your take on the the market share that you your goal, like what market share you would like to see as Carvana, like with your your big audacious goal is and yeah. kind of paint the light of like how that actually plays out according to the size of the auto industry. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, let, let me start with just some context. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think it is very, very interesting to look at all of these other retail verticals and say, who's the largest player in each of these retail verticals? And so you've got like Kroger and groceries and you got, you know, Home Depot and, uh, yep. you know, Walmart and Amazon. You've got all these, these enormous companies, Best Buy. The average of those companies in their respective verticals, the largest one has a 30% market share. So a 30% right. market share in automotive retail, if, if you're focused on used only, would be 12 million units per year. Right. That is you know, an astronomical number. That's, you know, that's 15 times larger than the largest automotive retailer right. in the country today. Which I think that's car, all kinds it's of- CarMax, I believe, 2%, two, two right? The largest player has 2%. It, exactly. And so there's been all kinds of interesting questions around, like, well, why is this market so fragmented? And, and you know, that, that could be like a, a really long, separate conversation. I won't dive into <laughs> it now. Absolutely. But, but, but I think it does point to an incredible opportunity. And so, you know, our, our kind of long-term goal that we put out there is we want to sell 2 million units per year, which would, which would mean that we have a 5% market share um, nationwide. And it's something that we absolutely think is attainable as long as we execute, given kind of the response that we're seeing from customers and the scalability of the model that we, that we feel like we've built and everything else. But I think what's interesting is, I think, you know, often dealers hear that, and one, they probably think we're crazy, and that's, that's all fine and good. Uh, but then two, I think it, it's maybe a scary sounding number because, you know, they think to themselves, okay, well, Carvana's gonna be bigger than the biggest automotive retailer by, you know, a multiple. What, what does that mean for me? But right. I do think that it's, it just, it's important to also think about the fact that, you know, if you assume that we attain that goal, that's gonna be 5% market share. And every, you know, every dealer, if they look at kind of their monthly volatility in their sales, they probably see you know, a standard deviation five. of way more than 5%, right? It's probably 10% oh, plus. absolutely. Yeah, Easy. maybe 20%. And so to me, it's just like, um, I don't think that our success is, is going to even be noticeable, um, you know, for, to the average dealer who's, who's executing well. I, I think there's, there are so many levers that they have every day in their own business that are so much more powerful than, you know, what we're doing absorbing market share that I really do think that it's not even going to be you know, felt by, by you know, those that are executing well. And I think that those that aren't executing well, maybe we'll point to it as, as one of the reasons that things aren't going as well as they could have gone. But I don't think it's realistically going to be a major driver. I just think this market is so, so large. We are I, I, I saw a quote from you. I, can't, I could not remember where I saw it. Um, but it basically said, you said, pivots are okay, but at some point, you need to figure out what you believe in. Do you remember that by any chance? I, I, I don't remember the specific quote, but I definitely, uh, I, I definitely agree with and, and remember the sentiment. Could you explain that a little bit? Like, cause I know like entrepreneurs, startups now focusing a little, a little uh, away from the automotive industry and more like entrepreneurial CEO level, like leading an organization that I think we hear the word pivot a lot today. And, you know, we, we overuse the word in my opinion. What is your, what is your, you know, sentiment on like, okay, like pivoting is important, but at some point you have to understand your trajectory. Like, could you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, so I mean, here's, I think the reality of, of building a business, I, I think, um, you're going to face uh, thousands of challenges. I was going to say a thousand. That's not even close to right. You're going to face thousands of challenges. Yeah. Yep. And your success and failure is not going to be like the nice, neat story that people are going to tell in retrospect, right? They're going to, Never. if you succeed, they're going to tell a story that's way too simple. And if you fail, they're going to tell a story that's way too simple. The reality is yeah. like you face all of these daily challenges and kind of mm -hmm. on average, did you overcome them or, or did you not? And I think it's, right. that's kind of what, what really matters to your actual success and failure. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, to me, like pivots, I would, um, I would try to put in like a broader conceptual basket, which is as you're going through and fighting those thousands of battles, you're going to learn a lot of things. And a lot of the things that you believed you know, before are not going to end up being right. And you're going to have to change things. 
Mm-hmm. The, the, the question is, you know, where in your hierarchy of beliefs are you willing to change and where are you not willing to change? And I think that what's just important to, to you know, make sure that everyone's thinking about it, or the, what I think is important when you're thinking about pivoting is just you shouldn't start a business unless you have, you know, four or five just core convictions that are very, very closely held that you cannot be moved off of. Because if you can be moved off them, you will be moved off them. Because, like, the world's yeah. going to come at you and it's going to be hard enough to where you're going to move off them. And if you're going to move off your convictions, then you have nothing and now you're just blowing in the wind. And so it's like there's, mm-hmm. there's no reason to even start the journey if you're going to move off those things. Now, the, the other things, you know, the, the thousands of way smaller things that, that aren't your core convictions – Mm-hmm. You need to be flexible and you need to be willing to say like, okay, this isn't like a thing that I deeply believed when I started. This is something that I thought was right up front and I'm learning now that it's wrong and I need to change it. And I think that the word pivot more often than not is used for like kind of these higher order business model changes, not for all the micro changes that you should be making every single day. And yep. so in that sense, I don't believe in pivots. Like I think, you know, if, if you're an investor investing in an entrepreneur, you should want that entrepreneur to have convictions they will not give up, right? They should, they should have their teeth yes. into those convictions so strongly that they're going to just fight them to their dying breath because yeah. that's what has to happen to succeed. And so I yeah. just don't think you should ever pivot on those things. Now, all the little things, you've got to be flexible because you're going to be wrong about a million things. That's just how the world is. And so yep. to me, like I, I just... I like, you know, testing, iterating on things that aren't super important, but the yep. things that you deeply believe, I just, my personal view, which could very well be wrong, is that you should not pivot off those things. You should hold to them. I love the concept of being able to define those and decide at the beginning that, hey, these are the things that I won't bend on. And if that means I can't make it or I can't be successful, then this business I'm starting or what I'm trying to do isn't, isn't worth doing. So for you personally, and thinking in the, the context of Carvana, what are some of those big things and those big convictions that you're unwilling to pivot on? So, yeah, so I, I think the most important thing, like the, the, to me, the white space in the industry is deliver to customers a great experience when buying a car where they get a high quality car at a fair price. They don't have a stomachache yep. afterwards. The experience itself yep. was as fun as getting the car. They were excited about the car before they started buying it. Don't ruin it yep. in the in the retail transaction itself. That is the goal, right? Make the customer experience great. And so if that's the goal, right, you, then you have to build a culture around delivering those great customer experiences. You have to build a business model that enables those great experiences. And so our nice. view is that the reason experiences haven't been great in automotive retail for a while is basically because there's shared economics across all these different dealers and the cost structure is very high and this forces a lot of backroom profit taking. And so we want to keep our costs really low because we think that that's the fundamental that enables you know, better customer experiences. So we want our variable costs to be really low. That's a deeply held conviction. And then you know, our principles are treat people fairly. Uh, I think that there's uh, in, in retail and, and just with people in general, th- there are many kind of psychological quirks that, that people um, have. And I think that oftentimes the most profitable thing to do in any business is to take advantage of psychological quirks that, that people have. And we don't want to do that, right? We want to build a business that is simple, uh, that, that doesn't take advantage of, of any uh, you know, psychological mistakes that people might be making. And, and so yep. that, that I would just kind of bundle in fairness. So to me, it's, it's yeah. a great experience. Maintain fair. low variable costs. You deliver something that's fair to customers in the long run, it's going to pay you back. And then I think after yep. that, everything else is in service of those goals and everything else is on the table, right? Like everything else yeah. we, we can, we can move and change, but like those are our convictions and we're not going to, we're not going to change those. It's, it's interesting that you say that because like the things that you just mentioned are the things that kind of transcend like the concept of innovation, right? These are like human elements that you're talking about. Well, and, and, and going back to entrepreneurship, I mean, I think every business has basically uh, three major constituencies, and, and, and they're, they're, debatably there's a fourth, but there's three major constituencies. You've got your employees, you've got your customers, and you've got your shareholders. Yep. And I think that one thing that I just love about a startup is that every startup, every new company, you don't have the inertia of customers already transacting with you to where you even have the luxury to be able to choose to elevate shareholders above all else and just start to kind Mm -hmm. of leverage that inertia to to monetize the transaction a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You basically have to create an employee experience that is high quality so people Mm -hmm. want to build what you're building and a customer Mm -hmm. experience 
that is differentiated and positive. Otherwise, consumers will not interact with you. And so to me, yeah. what I love about startups is they have to elevate those constituencies. It's like you don't have a choice. And I think that you know, basically what, what happens to businesses is, is they get this inertia, and once they already have customers, they already have kind of employees coming, the machine is really big, they start to forget oh, yeah. about we've got to make our employees happy every day to keep pushing forward. And we've got to make sure that we continue to deliver a great experience to our customers and we keep innovating so that we don't create, you know, kind of wiggle room for other people to come in and take our customers away from us. And they start to just think about, yeah. we've got all this inertia, let's monetize it more completely. And there's nothing wrong with, with you know, businesses need to make money. Like that, that needs to happen. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if you overvalue that, you're just creating susceptibility. You're just creating room for someone else to come in and out innovate you. And I think that, yeah. you know, that's what happens. That's what the innovation cycle is in my mind. It's just businesses get big enough to where they get comfortable. And then, you know, yeah. some startup somewhere that's hungry that's going to put, you know, its employees and customers in front of shareholders yep. is going to come eat your lunch. And that's, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, no, I love that concept. I, I was just having a conversation, and it was it was surrounding uh, really a, a web, an internet, a website company in automotive, and really the principle I was saying was like, look, eventually you come up with this really innovative thing to start with, and we see this cycle, and it's a lot like what you just said. You innovate, so you come up with this thing that's valuable, and then you grow fast, and so you build a machine around that to sustain the growth and keep delivering that one thing, right? And then eventually you need to keep feeding that machine. So you have less time and attention on the people you're putting into the machine because now they're more like just cogs to keep the machine running. And meanwhile, like you have another startup with the same fire you had six, seven years ago to saying like, actually, this is what customers really want now. And so we're just gonna build that. And that's, I think that's like the David and Goliath scenario. You have the Goliath after they've built it, but the startup comes in and they have the advantages you just talked about and saying like, well, they don't have this inertia going. They get to focus on the most important things in business, which are the people on your team and the people you're serving as your customers. And they don't play Goliath's game. They play David's game. And I think that's just what you explained. And so how are you going to keep Carvana from turning into that is the real question. Yeah, well, so, and, and I, think, I think that is the real question. And I also think it's, it's so interesting because th that is the cycle, right? It's like the, the, the cycle of yes. corporate life is that every company at some point was a hungry startup. And then, you know, yep. all of the, the big, slow-moving bureaucracies that exist in the world today, at one point, like somewhere along the way, they turn from hungry startup to that thing they now are. And so how do you fight yep. that, that gravity yourself is, is a huge question. And I think that, that that's where to me, like I have a tremendous amount of respect for Amazon. They're an easy company yeah. to respect. But one of the things that I really respect about them is I think that they've done an excellent job building a culture and then building a, an organizational structure that supports truly thinking about everything like it's day one, right? Like, and I think that yeah. to me, that's why I, I think debatably, Amazon has the greatest engine of any company around today. And it's because they have these principles that are you know, really deeply ingrained in, in the company. Mm -hmm. They absolutely mm -hmm. believe in entrepreneurship and, and kind of acting every day like it's day one. They have these yeah. two pieces of teams that they keep small so they maintain that hunger. Uh, I think they do a good job uh, from what I can ascertain from the outside, kind of allocating decision making to, to different parts of the organization so it's, it's not just a big mm -hmm. monolith. And I think that because of that, they've built an incredible engine that continues to innovate at unbelievable scale. And I think that's incredible. So to me, I think we have to try to emulate that. And I think we're so far away from, from there. It, it's crazy. And, and, you know, in, in my opinion, maybe one company in the history of the world has achieved what they've achieved so far in terms of building that kind of an engine. So it's yeah, obviously going to be super great. hard. But I think the, the first step to doing something, uh, you know, great and fighting gravity might pull you to something that's not great is I think recognizing that gravity and then trying to recognize what you think the solution is. And, and from what I can observe so far, I think Amazon has found the closest thing to that solution that I can see. And I think we're going to try to emulate, you know, many parts of that. It's, it's funny. I'm wearing a shirt right now that I made uh, about a year ago and it says because Amazon on it, that's all it says. And um, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I use that to talk about the answer. That's why customers have this expectation. That is why we started to be comfortable with different types of retail experiences. But you just added a layer onto that um, in the sense of like, that's why it works if you keep that day one mentality. 
And your answer, I think, is really the answer, right? Once you acknowledge that the gravity exists, well, now you can actually actively make sure that you don't get pulled into the tractor beam. So um, that that's a really great answer and an interesting answer. Um, and I think that that is even, you know, Carvana is not the size of Amazon, it has been around as long, but at the same time, um, I, I see that. I see that in the organization as you've scaled from, you know, those first days to even 103 deal or 103 outlets or markets where you are now. Um, I have a couple, couple more questions, and these questions are really directed toward you personally because on the podcast, I like to help, help people understand the person behind, you know, the movement or the company or the message uh, because I think we hear a lot about, you know, what the person's done from an organizational standpoint, typically. So you you said something as well. Um, and again, you, if you don't remember the quote, you'll probably resonate it. Uh, it's because you said it. Uh, don't question your convictions just because someone else does. So that quote, I want to overlay that into the question, what do you want your personal legacy to be? Not in business, but in life. Ernie Garcia, when he's gone, right, people are going to remember something and what do you want them to remember? Oh man, there's a lot in there. So I mean, first, I, I think, <laughs> just uh, easy I, questions. I, I save the easy ones for the end. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, appreciate it. Let, let me try to answer like what my what my motivations are. I think um, at a at an emotional level, mm-hmm. I love to compete. Right? If if we run into each other someday and there's a ping pong table nearby, or there's you know, bags we can throw or a basketball court or a flat piece it's of ground on, right. wrestle. Well, yeah, like whatever you want to do, I, I will happily compete and I will be positive I'm going to win until you prove me otherwise. Because it's just, it's just fun, right? Uh, and and yeah. so I've always enjoyed competing and I think that, that um, that's like a major emotional source of motivation. I think like, um, mm. you know, I, I don't even know what, how to define it, maybe intellectually. I think it's fun to exercise your brain thinking about hard problems. And, and so I think... Um, when you can you know, take on an, an interesting problem set and try to solve those problems, that, that's, um, that's satisfying to me in, in life. It's like it's a, it's a fun thing to spend your time doing, and then it's, it's fulfilling when you feel like you come up with something that makes some sense. And so I think like intellectually, you know, that, that's kind of um, where my motivations are. And, and then I think um, maybe philosophically, I think you know, the impact we have in the world is basically what we do and how we influence others and, and how that influence mm-hmm. changes what they do. And, and that kind of manifests as, as far as, as far as I can tell, like the, the most important human quantity is basically just happiness, right? That, that's really what matters. And so to me, it's, do you have some expertise, um, you know, or, or some capabilities that you can point in some direction that in aggregate are going to lead to more human happiness than would otherwise exist if you didn't point your energies in that direction? Ernie, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, It was just a pleasure having a conversation with you today and the best of luck. Thanks. Have a good one. Thanks. So what do you think? I do think that that interview was kind of indicative of the, the heart of the guy, the heart of the man behind it. And I hope that, you know, when we do podcasts, I don't want to just talk about the business side or the, the hype side of someone who's accomplished something or is doing something really cool. But in the end, I think we understand that we're all people and the heart behind why we do things and the impact that we want to leave and the things that drive us is what makes us human, is what makes us people, which is why we connect and why you're watching or listening to this podcast is because there's some element of heart that connects. So I just want to say thank you for listening. I want to say thank you for being part of the community. have a lot of amazing stuff coming up. We're about to release my first book, The Automotive Manifesto. Um, it's happening. We're like talking about printing and when we're going to get it and how we're going to put it on Amazon and where we're going to start pre-orders. We also are building a website for it. So we hope to have a lot of great giveaways and giving away content because the goal behind writing the book is to make us as a community better. So I want to make sure it's very accessible and that the message gets out there and we can find the other people who agree that These are the things that we need to do and the approaches we need to take. That's the main point of the book. If we can make traction, if I personally can make an impact with the book, I want it to be that it unified the people that believe the same things. That's it. It's in the books. It's in the can. Episode 58, Clarity Compressed Podcast. Have an amazing week.